Good morning, everyone. Uh, Rob Garcia with Winfield United Professional Products. And today we're going to talk about uh, utilizing organic fertilizers um, in, your, in your lawn care programs. So the agenda for today, um, we're going to review some of the essential elements and briefly go over where they come from, how we can utilize them in our programs, and <clears throat> what we get from the, just from the environment. Uh, we'll, then we'll talk about types of organic fertilizers, um, what makes it an organic fertilizer and an organic nutrient component, um, the differences between organic and inorganic, and then we'll briefly go over some of the things that we have to offer when we're building organic-based programs for your uh, lawn care. So uh, there's 17 essential elements for plants. Um, we have the macronutrients and we get uh, three of them, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen from the atmosphere. So the plants are able to take either carbon dioxide or water vapor from the atmosphere and utilize them in their metabolic processes. We then have the primary nutrients and those would be what you see on your traditional bag of fertilizer. Um, we have uh, nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, NPK. And those are the numbers that you see on the bag. So if the bag, for example, is a 20-5-10, there's gonna be 20% nitrogen, 5% phosphorus and 10% potassium. Um, the secondary macronutrients are essential for plant health and growth. Uh, they are calcium, magnesium and sulfur. And in certain inst instances, we will sometimes see um, calcium and sulfur uh, listed on the uh, analysis on the bag. Um, an example would be calcium nitrate, which would be a 15-0-0-15.5, or with sulfur, the example would be uh, ammonium sulfate, which is a 21-0-0, so it's 21% nitrogen, but it also has 24% sulfur. So just some examples of where we do see those secondary macronutrients on, on the label. Um, for our micronutrients, these are gonna be our much smaller um, amounts. Um, you'll see that we've shown that they're less than a thousand parts per million. Um, and uh, typically when we look at soil reports, um, look at soil data, et cetera, we'll see, we'll see a lot of these in the, the 100 to 200, 100 to 300 parts per million. So we have manganese, iron, copper, zinc, boron, molybdenum, chlorine, and nickel. Now, the key thing is to remember that with turf grass, especially when we're working in our home lawns, um, we have manganese and iron that both affect the chlorophyll molecule. So they help our grass be greener. So we, everybody wants that dark green lush color. So we need to be you know, make sure that especially uh, manganese and iron, which have a synergy and are in many of our micronutrient packs uh, together that we have, um, they are essential for good green color. So if you make a fertilizer application and say we're getting good growth, we got lots of clipping production every week where we go out and mow, but we just don't have the color that we're looking for the applications of some micronutrients would be how we would increase that color and give us a more dark lush green look that we're, that we're looking for. So in, in organics, we have a huge amount of acronyms, SRN, slow release nitrogen, SGN, uh, SIB gradient number, um, OMRI, um, USDA, um, APHIS, all these things, are acronyms that we get caught up on <clears throat> when we're looking at fertilizer and looking at inorganic versus organic. Um, and when we're trying to put our program together, a lot of times we get back to TTWWADI. That's what we've always done. So that's why we're gonna do it again. So what we're trying to do now is that we're trying to accomplish more environmentally, sensitive, environmentally safe um, uh, fertilizer programs. So we're going to do some changes, and we're going to go. Uh, we're going to go against what we've always done, and we're going to make changes that are going to be more beneficial, not only for the environment or uh, leaching, nutrient leaching, runoff, etc., but also give us a better overall soil health, 
giving us better overall plant health. So some of the differences between organic and inorganic fertilizers. Organic fertilizers, um, they could be both plant foods and soil foods. So we not only can affect what the plant needs as far as its nutritional amounts, but also feeding the soil. Now we have to remember that our soil is full of millions and millions of bacteria, fungi, and, and essentially has a very enormous microbial population. Now, that microbial population likes carbon as a food source. So when we look at, when we look at feeding the soil, essentially what we're trying to do is feed the microbial population, which then will have a better efficiency on breaking down the nutrients that we're supplying. And this is, this holds true for both inorganic and organic. Um, they, the organic products always have lower NPK values. Um, an example would be, again, I, I mentioned ammonium sulfate, 2100, 24% sulfur. Um, and we'll compare that to say some of our, our standard biosolids, which are uh, 440, 630, et cetera. So much lower amounts. So we're going to have to get the same amount of nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium from these products. We need to put down more material. So we're gonna put down more material, but we're gonna put it down in a form that's more beneficial for the environment and for the soils. Um, they do have a little bit higher cost. Um, essentially that goes back to what I just mentioned and that is because we need to put down more pounds. Um, you do have products now that do contain some microbiology. Um, we have products that already have bacteria or beneficial bacteria or mycorrhiza added to them. Mycorrhiza is a, is a fungi that helps with nutrient uptake across the uh, root hair. So very beneficial. All plants have mycorrhiza at some level, but if we introduce more, we can increase establishment, overall plant health. Um, I've done some studies where we've added uh, mycorrhiza and beneficial bacteria to ornamental programs and have had a substantially higher level of, um, of success with um, establishment and overall survival. Um, one of the things that we do have with these products is there is some odor. So when you're utilizing organics, be prepared, especially after you water the water the products into the, into the soil that you will have some odor. And that's just the products. I mean, think about what we're, what these products are made out of. We have manures, et cetera. And I'll go into some of those later in the presentation, but we do, we do have some odor. Um, another thing that we get is we get carbon. Again, I mentioned that mycorrhiza and the beneficial bacteria use carbon as a food source. So adding carbon to the soil increases your microbial population gives you an overall better soil health, which gives us overall better plant health. Um, our inorganics, um, they're just plant food only. Um, they're not gonna do anything to help with the soils. So we're not gonna feed the bacteria, we're not gonna feed the mycorrhiza, and we're not gonna improve our overall soil health. Um, we have high totals of NPK, common in our industry, urea, 46% uh, nitrogen, and so because of that, um, we have products that uh, are um, able to be put down at much lower amounts um, because of their higher nitrogen so, and, and phosphorus and potassium. Um, we can get these in soluble forms and we can get slower release in soluble forms. These are readily available. So if we have programs where we would like to spray rather than spread granulars, we have that ability. <clears throat> with uh, slow release as well. So we can put down products that are stick around longer. They're not gonna be leached outside the, uh, the root zone or lost in, in surface runoff. So we'll keep our fertilizer that we're putting out where we're putting it. Um, because of this lower amount, we do see slightly lower cost. Now that can vary a little bit when we start to talk about different slow release nitrogen technology, which then can start to get the cost per thousand cost per acre into essentially the same number. Um, micronutrients are readily available. They're ready avail readily available in their raw form. Um, a lot of our micronutrients in our non-chelated forms tend to be magnesium sulfate, manganese sulfate, zinc sulfate, et cetera. Uh, chelation and complexing is something that we can do to help those micronutrients stay more available to the plant. 
and then we'll be able to have them in, in the root zone for a longer period of time for the plant to take in. One of the things that happens to micronutrients in some of these forms is that the soil, especially in higher pH soils, can get so the micronutrients are unavailable to the plant. So you might run a soil report and you'll see that uh, the micronutrients are in the soils, but because of the pH, because of some other factors um, with our soil health, uh, the micronutrients are unavailable. So improving that soil health, again, with our organic program will allow us to keep some of those micronutrients in forms that are readily available for the plant. Um, they're lower odor, so that's always a benefit if we're working with residentials. People don't like odor around their homes. It's something that, you know, sets off a, a warning and they're cautious because they smell something. But um, that is uh, one of the benefits of inorganic fertilizers. So they both have their benefits and they both have their, their negatives. But overall, um, the organics will help us not only with our plant uh, health, but also with our soils, which gives us an overall better um, program for, for the long term. Um, so um, Let's look at a few of the um, a few of the different types of organic fertilizers and inorganic fertilizers. Then also choosing the uh, the right fertilizer for the application. So types of organic ferts, uh, they're plant and animal based. Um, common ones are sewer sludge. <clears throat> These are manufactured all over the United States. Uh, Malorganite has been around for over 75 years. It was the original sewer sludge from the uh, Milwaukee Waste Treatment Facility. Um, now we're starting to get into composted materials. Uh, we uh, dehydrated poultry waste, uh, turkey litter. Um, all of these are common. Um, some animal manures are also very common. Um, one of the key things with our, with our composted materials is whether or not the products were aerobically composted or anaerobically composted. And anaerobic composting is a much quicker process. The companies that do this are not correctly aerifying and aerobically composting their, their, their organic uh, animal waste. Um, those are going to be, uh, those are gonna be, tend to be higher in salts. Uh, they're gonna have a, a little bit higher pH so things that are gonna be detrimental. So when you're looking at composted material, you want to buy from quality reputable sources that aerobically compost their materials at the right temperatures and for the right amount of time, getting them to naturally break down. So what they're giving you is ready to be broken down once you water in the fertilizer, the granular uh, prill, and then um, will be available to the plant. We are now seeing um, meals and these are becoming more and more common. Um, and uh, we see fish, blood, blood and bone have been around for, for a long time, but tend to be a little bit expensive. Um, we're also seeing soy meals, alfalfa meal, et cetera. So all of these are natural based raw organic materials that they put through a process to put them into a form that they can either be made into a granular or potentially a soluble. We do have some um, organic-based solubles. Um, proteins can be reacted now to make protein hydrosylates, which are basically reacted with a strong base. And we create these slow-release water-insoluble protein products. Um, we also have um, products that can be made into liquids. We see fish meal and some of our other products that can be readily made into kelp. Um, is another one. We see kelp that is extracted and made into organic um, sources. So lots of lots of things are coming on the market. And I really believe that this is going on because of the demand by the public for organic, more environmentally uh, safe products. Um, common types of inorganic fertilizers. Uh, we have our general minerals, uh, urea is probably the most common and that includes all types, whether it's been um, reacted and made into methylene urea and the urea formaldehyde type products. Um, we also have ureas that are stabilized to keep them in the soils and available for longer periods of time. Um, we have true synthetics where they actually just react a couple of products to get to an endpoint. And then we have the combination products. 
Um, the combination products are something that I've had a lot of success with in programs and you basically have products that are part organic and part um, and part uh, inorganic. And balancing the ratio of those two allows us to get a product that one, has the benefits for the soil health of the organics, but also has a little bit higher uh, NPK percentages so that we don't have to spread huge amounts of fertilizer when we go out and make an application. Um, so we're going to go into briefly some of the types of organic fertilizers and um, the original, the first ones that were out there, um, then became plant and animal um, byproducts. So this process creates a stable humus and organically chelated plant nutrients, um, lots of biology. And the key thing, and that's what you see going on in the, uh, in the, the photo of the slide, is that is the machine where they are, and notice, notice the steam coming up. So they're, they're, they're aerobically composting and then they're turning the material <clears throat> to help promote, <coughs> excuse me, to help promote better aerobic uh, breakdown of the raw uh, turkey litter in this, in this photo. So that's something that, again, as I stated earlier, separates the good organic companies from the bad organic companies. Now, something to note is that we do now have the capability through some um, plant health and they basically measure the carbon dioxide that's being given off by these, by these um, bacteria and other, other organisms that are creating this aerobic composting um, effect. So we are able to measure that. So we can now actually look at the quality of a compost um, with some new uh, sophisticated uh, soil testing uh, processes. So mineral-based, um, basically um, mineral-based organic fertilizers that have been around for a long time. Um, they are um, minerals that are mined and collected, but in the form that they're found in, they are in a form that is ready to be put into fertilizer. There's no further chemical reactions, processing um, that has to go on. So they can be considered, and we do see these utilized in a lot of our, um, in a lot of our uh, organic products that we see out there. Um, limestone, where they're just fossilized shell deposits, are a great source of calcium. Um, anaerobic marine deposits, we find these all over the place around the world where they can collect these materials. And then because they're in the form that's readily available to the plant, they don't need any further processing. Uh, rock phosphates have been around forever. Uh, a good nitrogen source uh, that you'll see utilized is uh, soda of nitrate, which is basically a mined um, nitrate form that can be utilized in organic fertilizers. So we'll see those added into organic blends. Um, some of the blends that we're going to talk about later will have small amounts, gives them a little bit of quick release nitrogen. Um, one thing that I do want to bring up is peat. Um, that is a precursor to the coal. Uh, peat is found in bogs. It's also found in other areas in, in layers of, of, of shale and, and coal deposits. Um, it doesn't have any nutritional value to the plant, but we do see the benefits to the soil by aeration of the soil. So if you're in areas that have heavy clay soils, um, the addition of peat is going to uh, help aerate, flocculate that soil. Um, we also have peat being able to have good absorption of water. So when you do water, if you have a higher peat content, in your soils, you will hold on to water longer. Uh, we see this, and this is a great example where that's how they would build a USDA green. A USDA green is going to be a 90-10 um, sand to peat. The peat's in there to help with water and help with um, compaction. So um, it, is, it is sometimes credited as being um, a widely used organic fertilizer and is by far the top organic amendment. We see people putting soil blends together that have high contents of peat all the time. A lot of our growers that we deal with in the greenhouse and nursery industry, um, a lot of their smaller plants, they're essentially started in almost straight peat or a peat soil mixture. 
Um, but again, peat is not a nutrient. So um, as far as our animal source materials, um, we have both uh, animal manures, uh, residues from the slaughter. That's where we're gonna get our bone and blood meals. So they're gonna collect those and then grind them up into a form that either can be processed into a granular, added to granulars before we, 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 we prill um, the fertilizer. Um, we, we have our, our largest portion are gonna be from the, uh, the dairy industry and our egg producing poultry. Uh, one of the facilities that we have here where I live in Colorado is an egg producing facility that collects all of their litter and then co aerobically compost it. And uh, they have a dehydrator and a pelletizer. And at the end of the day, we have 100% poultry waste from basically the fertilizer plant being built at the egg producing facility. Um, we also have animals that are raised for meats and hide production. Um, they, they tend to be also now converted into blood meal, bone meal, um, and some other nutrients from their hoofs and horns, just because uh, that industry has been hit hard um, economically. So they're looking for other avenues to help produce uh, revenue based on the byproducts from the animals that even though meat production or dairy is the number one source, they have these other things that they can use to help uh, supplement their income. Um, chicken litter, that's probably our biggest one. Um, and um, in a lot of cases, it'll get mixed with sawdust, it'll get, it'll be, get composted and can be utilized as a great soil conditioner um, and um, will actually be beneficial in the breakdown of certain synthetic fertilizers. So in a lot of cases, a lot of our blends that you'll see, there'll be a portion of a litter. Um, we're gonna discuss later on some programs for a company called Sustain. Many of the Sustain products will have their turkey litter, basically the same type of a process, but with turkey. Um, and uh, they will then um, be utilized with synthetic fertilizers for better nutrient performance and overall soil health. Um, we've had, and this, I mentioned this earlier, the biosolids, basically that's sewer sludge. Um, and it is an effluent from the waste treatment facility. Um, it is composted and then dried out um, when it's deemed biologically safe. Uh, these products have been used all over the country, uh, they, they'll use them in silviculture, which would be basically tree production. Um, I see a lot of these types of products utilized for soil remediation, for reclamation projects, etc. cetera. Um, I've seen them specked into areas where we've had forest fires out west and you'll have the uh, Department of Agriculture will use them as the organic source for reclamation and reestablishment. Um, the, uh, they are, again, um, because of what they are made out, what they are processed from, um, you do tend to pick up some heavy metals. So many, many companies will test their biosolids and they'll test the heavy metals, they'll test the other micronutrients, uh, because uh, our bodies tend to accumulate those types of compounds. So we have a fair amount of micronutrients and um, in some cases, uh, heavy metals in our, uh, in our waste. So um, that's something that has to be, so they go through very specific programs and uh, these are the types of products that cannot be sold in all states. There are certain states now in the West that are starting to restrict the use of uh, biosolids as an organic source, great organic source. Um, the one thing I see about them because of the amount of micronutrients, especially organic based iron, we get a very good color response out of biosolids. Um, this was an old um, traditional technique in golf that you would put down an application of a biosolid right before winter in your cool season markets. So this is something that's very common, but we do start to see parts of the country that would prefer you not using biosolids um, because of some of the other things that we could potentially have in the material, even though a lot of companies are now testing for that so they can show you that theirs are composted correctly and those materials have been um, removed 
And so um, that's something that's going to go. And that's, I think, one of the other reasons why some of the other organic products have become more prevalent and available because they're trying to get around. Again, these are very economical products, very, very cheap to apply. But because of some of the negatives for them, some of the other organic sources have become more popular. Um, as far as plant-based um, processed uh, organic fertilizer, these will include composted materials like we had discussed earlier. Uh, humic acids. Um, humic acids are another product that, much like peat, is derived from Leonardite shale. And humic acids, fulvic acids, and human are very beneficial for that soil health aspect that we mentioned earlier, and also for water retention and um, helping to break up heavy clay soils, etc. cetera. Uh, amino acids are starting to become more and more popular. Um, we see some very beneficial um, results from the utilization of amino acids. One of the things that's nice about these is that they are um, in many cases an extracted from a, 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 a seed. Um, there's, different, there's different fermentation processes that help produce uh, large amounts of amino acids. And we are now starting to carry a number of products that have high levels of amino acids in them. Um, also sea, seaweed extract, um, basically the majority in the, uh, in the Northern hemisphere in the United States and Canada are gonna be harvested in the Nova Scotia area. Uh, companies have large beds of kelp and they are essentially let them grow up. They harvest, they return, they harvest, they return. There's two processes that they either will go through um, the one process gives you a better product, a little easier to use and a little cleaner, um, a little, also a little lower in odor. And that process would be where they actually freeze the kelp that shatters the cell wall. They're able to take all the good portions of the kelp out of the cell and then, and then um, concentrate and, and formulate that into a product. The, the, the cheaper way is to grind up um, large, I'll just basically grind up the kelp. So you're also getting the cellulose, the cell wall, et cetera. So there are some more contaminants in those. And because we are not just extracting the good portion of what's in the cell. And what, when I say that, I mean, we have cytokinins, gibberellic acid, organic amino acids. There's also um, um, a full, uh, full array of colloidal uh, elements. So we pick up a lot of micronutrients and other stuff just because they're inside the cell of the kelp plant. And um, we get all those beneficial plant hormones that help improve our overall plant health. Um, when we get the cellulose, por cellulose portion in the cell wall, the negative uh, is, uh, we, I've heard a lot of complaints about uh, the odor. So when you're looking at not all seaweed extracts are created equal, the, the freezing, the, the freeze dry process is a much um, better process and gives you a cleaner overall product. Um, other ARS studies have found that algae um, can be used to capture nitrogen and phosphorus. So currently we're looking at how to create um, large algae um, systems that could essentially produce um, and collect the nitrogen and phosphorus. Those are the two of the nutrients. Those are the two that have the most negative effect on our environment. Um, nitrogen runoff um, causes um, contamination to our water source and nitrogen, especially in the nitrate form, is the most readily mobile. And then phosphorus um, has been proven in studies throughout the Midwest for all the last 40 years or so that eutrophication of water weighs by phosphorus. And they actually have data that shows that waterways have started to fill in just because of the phosphorus runoff from agriculture. Um, so we need to look at and buy by looking at our organic-based products, we can look at products that will be able to, um, not they're not mobile, they stay in the soil, they, they improve the soil health. So we're not having them leach out into our waterways and have the effect, the negative effect on our environment that we had with synthetic and um, traditional nitrogen and phosphorus uh, materials. So um, just a brief here, and we've discussed this a few times, um, just a real brief about the, the differences between organic, aerobically composted organics and non-decomposed organics. So in their raw, raw form, basically. And again, I can't stress enough 
that uh, we need to make sure that we use aerobically composted organics so that one, they're biologically stable versus the non-decomposed, they're still going through their breakdown. So in the breakdown, they may be pulling the oxygen and other essential nutrients out of the soil and creating a, a soil health situation where it actually is detrimental to the plants we're trying to grow. Um, one of the things that we have with aerobic and compost is we start to get to a consistent neutral pH. Um, a neutral pH of around seven or even slightly acidic, six, five or so is our ideal, um, our, our ideal pH for uh, plant growth. And then when we have things that still have to break down, we may vary the pH. So we may put it down and we think it's a pH of seven, but because it has to go through decomposition, all of a sudden we swing the pH to the alkaline side to a higher pH. And what does that cause? Binding up of our micronutrients and putting some of our desirable plant nutrients in forms that the plant can't use. Um, the, again, we stated earlier that these are safe for plants because they're in a form that's neutral and biologically stable, where the non-decomposed still have to go through decomposition. So they're gonna start to pull oxygen out of the soils. Um, when we look at what acids, what organic acids are found in these products, um, we have in the organically composted humic and fulvic acids and at, at the pHs and with these acids, we're gonna have a high aerobic organism um, counts in these products where when we haven't decomposed the, the organics, um, we're gonna have a number of uh, anaerobic organic acids, acetic, bit, butric, um, these, these acids are going to have a detrimental effect on our microbial population. So again, stressing over and over that we want to buy aerobically composted organic materials. Um, and then, um, many of the products and, um, we have, we have, we have relatively slow to medium toxicity at very high doses. Um, you look at some of the rates on some of our liquid uh, humic and fulvic acid mixes, uh, gravity humic L, you can go up to two gallons uh, per, per acre, a very high rates versus some of these other um, anaerobic organic acids. They're toxic to plants at a part per million. You know, so we're, we're on a magnitude of, of, of thousands comparing the correctly aerobically composted organics with the non-decomposed organics. Now, why do we see both of these on the market? We see both of these on the market because that process takes time. It also takes um, energy and manpower to continually turn and roll, like we saw in the picture earlier, those, those piles to get them to aerobically compost. The non-decomposed can be basically collected, processed, and packaged, but they're not really giving the consumer and the industry what, what we need um, from these types of products. So what makes it organic? Um, so um, common organic sources, um, I, I, I've listed alfalfa, blood meal, bone meal, we've talked about a lot of these fish emulsion, fish meals. So in, in the processing of, of seafood, we generate shells and, and, and skins and tails and heads, that all can be used. So a lot of that is collected and ground up, dried, and then turned into fish meal. We have our manures, um, and then uh, rock phosphate. Rock phosphate's a great phosphorus source. Um, one of the nice things about rock phosphate is it's a phosphorus source with no nitrogen. So we're working with crops that potentially um, may not need any phosphor or any, any nitrogen. We have a good phosphorus source. Um, and then I, um, listed magnesium or potassium, magnesium sulfate, sulfamag, common material, great. Um, you get three different um, essential nutrients, um, one, one macro and two minor. And um, that's, that's, that's a similar to shale, something that we mine. Langdabenite is found all over the Western United States. So it's just a, another example of a good um, mineral that is mined from the ground. So it's organic based. Um, we do also out, out west mine potassium sulfate. If it stays in its unprocessed natural form, it can be utilized as a potassium source in organic fertilizers. 
We also see many um, wood chips and sawdust. Um, they're more than anything, they introduce carbon. So when we're trying to get a good carbon to nitrogen ratio. These materials will one, um, give the product a better consistency and it'll also increase the carbon. So, and then um, prom, that's something we see sold uh, throughout our industry and that's a phosphate rich organic manure. So um, I see a lot of that sold and it's, uh, uh, it's um, cattle based. Um, organic manure. So I, I, I just I just wanted to briefly talk about the OMRI certification process. Um, we see that on a lot of packages now, and I wanted to kind of quickly go through what that actually means. So when you have a new product, um, OMRI is an organization. It's not a it's not a government agency. It's an organization that monitors your organic certifications and processes. Now, um, they've developed this over the past oh, 15, 20 years. And um, it's a process that works because it does weed out the products that are either incorrectly composted or contain things that ingredients that they shouldn't. So um, to get through this briefly, um, so the product formulation has to be has to be um, given to the army organization. Um, they want you to say how you make the product and um, what the processing for all the ingredients is, and then um, they want you to if you're buying things and formulating them, they want proof of purchase um, so that they know that you're using the right sources. And then also um, the SDS and the MSD or SD, MSDS for the finished products so that they can look at it and make sure that we're not producing products that even though they're organic based, they could be hazardous. So they, they look at that. Um, they do not want you to use any genetically modified organisms um, and other, I, I list the ionizing radiation or nanotechnology when producing the products um, so you'll see on a lot of them now, uh, organic based products, on certified products, you also see uh, GMO free um, on the label. Um, and then um, you have to give them all of the sizes, the packaging, and then the big part is the final lab analysis of the, of the finished products. And what we see in these in many cases is um, I've seen it with a number of, uh, of organic based on certified insecticides where they were on the market for a while. And then all of a sudden they, on a, in a, a lab analysis check, found that there was synthetic insecticides because many of these facilities where the products are manufactured, manufacture other products, there was a contamination issue. The lab analysis will pick that up and until they can rectify that, that product will lose its OMRI certification. And I have seen products go on and off of the OMRI list based on contamination from where the products were, were manufactured. So when we when we, we do have a lot of um, OMRI certified products that get uh, repackaged and there's a specific set of, of, of requirements for repackaging, but very straightforward. How did you make the product? What's in the product? Lab analysis and dec you know the declaration that there are no GMO um, um, ingredients in your product. So that has kind of become the standard. Um, what we are seeing now is we're, as we get more and more organic-based agriculture is that the uh, USDA certification is becoming more and more common. So uh, some natural-based products uh, to finish up here today. And uh, so natural-based fertilizers combine the benefits of some of the inorganic uh, fertilizers. So again, uh, I'm, I'm not negative inorganic fertilizers. I want to put together programs that are, are able to decrease um, water contamination, leaching of nitrogen and phosphorus, and make products that do what, what they're designed to do, last the amount of time that we've said that they are, and are also beneficial to the soils. So natural-based 
um, fertilizers as are defined by the AAPFCO, another one of those big acronyms of an organization that helps control fertilizer um, quality and production, um, as having more than 50% of the mass and 50% uh, of the macronutrients derived from a natural or organic uh, based material. Um, so just a couple quick things about uh, nutrient levels. Um, organic fertilizers uh, generally contain um, a lot of different nutrients. Uh, on many of the labels uh, in certain states, you will see the NPK, potentially some of the other macronutrients, but many of the micronutrients will not be listed um, just because they are present. And uh, an example of this would be where um, we had to certify for some DOT uh, reclamation that I was working in a number of years ago, um, that poultry waste that we have readily available here because of the egg laying facility up in Platteville, Colorado. And um, so we ran all, we ran the actual lab test of the, uh, of the um, micronutrients. Uh, their goal was to make sure that our source was not high in heavy metals. That was the that was the reason. But what it did show is that there were a number of organically derived micronutrients: iron, manganese, um, and uh, I can't remember what the other one was. But in fairly high levels, so we didn't have it on the label, but they were in there because of what we find in some of these processes with the manufacturing and uh, of our our manures and uh, poultry waste. Um, so our inorganic fertilizers contain nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. If there are going to be micronutrients in those products, um, they're going to usually be put in there, and they're going to be put in there at levels um, that are set and designed for that specific blend. Um, so the other thing that we're going to vary when we look at inorganic fertilizer blends is the level of slow release. So our, our nitrates, our ammonium-based uh, molecules and raw urea, those are all quick release readily available. We can do things with our slow release. So not only are we gonna have our percentage of organic plus our percentage of inorganic fertilizer in our blend, we're also gonna have our levels of our slow release versus quick release nitrogen in our blends. Um, just as a side note, all organic-based nitrogen sources um, are, are slow release because they need microbial population to help break them down in the soils. So um, I did a little bit of a um, calculation here. Um, organic fertilizers, because of that low um, nitrogen analysis um, versus inorganic fertilizers, we need to put down much more material. Um, so, you know, for the example, um, we're trying to put down one pound of uh, nitrogen uh, per thousand square feet, and we want we're going to use a 20% nitrogen fertilizer. We're going to put down about five pounds of total material per thousand square feet. Now, if we go to an, an organic-based fertilizer, we're going to have to put down um, we're going to have to put down much more fertilizer to accomplish that. So, a common one um, that poultry waste again is a 532. So we're gonna have to put down four times the amount of material to get the same pound of nitrogen. Now, because the, all that nitrogen is going to be a slow release source, what we find is that we can actually put down much less and get the same results. We won't get the, the quick release aspect of inorganic nitrogen, but we will get the longevity. So in many cases, um, again, organic fertilizers are almost exclusively slow release. Uh, they need that, that bacteria, that mycorrhiza, et cetera, the fungi in the soils to break them down, to make them readily available for the plant. So that takes some time, especially if we have in springtime cooler soil temperatures. Um, the warmer the soil temperatures are, the more active the microbial population is gonna be. So the faster we're gonna see those products start to break down. So what we see with these processes and these, these programs with organics is you'll see in many of my recommendations, I'll have people going out at a half a pound. Um, you don't need as much because the nitrogen isn't being broken down so rapidly. The inorganic nitrogen, especially if it's all quick release, then 
the organic. So I tend to put down less and we still get very good results. Um, the thing that we don't get is we don't get that rapid response. So you always have to let people know when you start putting programs together with organic fertilizers that there's going to be a little slower um, breakdown because we have to have the soil temperatures and we have to have that microbial crop population start to break down that organic fertilizer. So we're going to wrap up here um, with a few uh, uh, organic and uh, versus synthetic uh, programs. Um, so with our synthetic fertilizers, generally higher NPK concentrations, 25, 5, 10 would be a common um, ratio that we sell here in Colorado all the time. Um, we have variable nitrogen releases, so we can play a little bit with how we want the product to react. So that's going to allow us to give the upfront release if that's what the customer is looking for, or more of that long-term feed, cutting down our overall applications per year that we need to make. Um, because of the uh, water-soluble um, effects of uh, quick-release nitrogen, we have a burn potential. If you put too much down, we don't water it in. If we have banding areas where we have high concentration so we don't get a good even fertilizer application, we can have some burn. And when you see that, you'll see that after the application, um, if you don't get it watered in or the concentration's too high, you will see that yellowing of the turf. In most cases, it's going to come back, but it's going to take, you know, two to three weeks, some extra watering, et cetera, even some potential overseeding to try to get those areas that were burned by the fertilizer application by too much quick release nitrogen to recover. Um, so again, um, we also have the effect of that burn, but also color streaking. So if we don't have a good even application over the entire area that we're trying to fertilize, we could have dark green areas, we could have light green areas that didn't get as much as we had, we had intended. And uh, so we need to get a good even application. Um, the, uh, the, the nitrogen and the potassium are going to be the most efficient of the two of the NPK of the macronutrients. Phosphorus is not so much. So phosphorus in a lot of cases in a lot of parts of the country now, um, because of that water contamination has been pulled out of fertilizer base. Um, we really in a lot of areas only apply phosphorus if we have a soil report saying that we have a phosphorus deficiency. Um, one of the things to look at with, with inorganic fertilizers is many of our soybeans have very high salt indexes, and I'm not referencing salt like sodium chloride, but um, high salts. So repeated applications over time will increase our salt index, and this is something that your general soil reports will tell you. So we may have a very healthy soil overall for NPK, but because it has high salts, high sodium, high um, uh, magnesium, calcium in some situations, um, that salt index will create a poor um, growing environment. And um, we can also, with these inorganic fertilizers, utilize them for um, our herbicides, insecticides, and um, and uh, fungicides, we do we can utilize them as a carrier. So there are some benefits at times when it would be a would be a better overall application because we can get some other benefits, whether it's weed control, insect control, or disease control from these types of products. Um, as far as our organic and our natural based fertilizers, lower NPK. Um, I've listed some common blends. You'll notice that the 10210 and the 1818. Those would be examples of where we have. 50% or greater organic uh, fertilizer and then some synthetic to bring that up. So we don't have to spread as many pounds per thousand. Um, we do have variable nitrogen releases, although typically they are all the majority slow release uh, fertilizers because of that, then uh, we have a very low burn potential. Um, I've never really seen anyone have any issues. So if we don't have good application techniques, uh, maybe our spreader or we're trying to deal with slopes, Etc. Hard to hard to spread areas, hard to spray areas. We are much safer and much less likely to damage the turf with organic materials. Um, and we do pick up those those organic based minerals that are in all of these products in small amounts. 
Um, they also have very low salt indexes. So as we utilize organic fertilizers, we're not gonna continually increase that salt index over time. And in some parts of the country which their soils already have a very high salt index, we can get into the, um, the uh, toxic threshold relatively quick with certain inorganic product, pro products. Um, because of the carbon that we're adding into these, that's in these materials, uh, we'll be increasing our soil microbial population. And what that does then, every time we apply our natural-based organic fertilizers, we will get better breakdown and better availability. So we want a really good soil microbial diversity and population. So adding carbon, which is the, their food source, will help us increase those. Um, and again, we do utilize, and that's why I'm a big fan of the natural-based blends where the organics help enhance the efficiencies of the synthetic fertilizers that we're utilizing. So what do we have to offer here? So what I've done is put together some programs um, that we have uh, available. And um, I put together a, a sustained organic fertilizer program uh, that is uh, aerobically composted um, turkey litter again. And um, I put it together into a four application program. If we get down into the Southern United States, I might add, a, you know, we get into Texas, um, down through some of you know, the warmer parts of the country where we're gonna have better uh, soil temperatures, we're gonna have better breakdown of our organic sources. I might add a fifth app, but in most parts of the country, the four app program will be, will be sufficient. Um, I've also put together some programs for uh, propene. And propeat is an interesting concept where, again, I mentioned the peat earlier, great carbon source, water retention, all of those aspects. So propeat is all the benefits of the carbon with some synthetic uh, fertilizer uh, components. And what they've done is they've found a way to crush those components, bond them with the peat, so that the peat helps to slowly release those nutrients. Now, the nice part is, is that every nutrient in the blend is in every, every particle. So it's, this is a homogenous product and very efficient. Um, it's a product that works great at low uh, application rates. Uh, the application rates are gonna be about uh, five pounds per thousand. Um, you'll see on most of the bags, they'll recommend 200 or just slightly over 200 pounds per acre. So those are products that you go out of five pounds. Um, the 25 pounders work great. One bag, 5,000 square feet. Very easy to calibrate. Um, very easy to use on your home and residential lawns. Uh, I also did um, highlight some other products, control products, because once we've gotten our our nutritional programs in line with our, the ideas that we've talked about today, organic fertilizers, et cetera. We can now look at other products for the control around our properties and our lawns um, and our landscapes that are organic based. Uh, Final Sand is an excellent uh, non-selective uh, herbicide. So you can utilize it to replace some of your traditional non-selective herbicide techniques. Um, spot spraying of rock, tree wells, um, fence lines, cracks in your driveway, et cetera. Final sand would be the choice. Uh, Fiesta is a selective um, organic uh, herbicide. So where we have weeds in our, in our, in our turf grass, um, we can utilize Fiesta to take those out. It's got a great label, broad spectrum, dandelions, clover, et cetera. Um, very effective. Uh, with both of these products, you're looking at um, a three to four week application interval. So for, for, the, for the average person, it's great to be able to go, okay, and every third week of every month throughout the summer, I get out and I do my final sand and my Fiesta applications. And you'll find that if you're, if you're diligent and consistent with these applications, that you will start to eliminate all of your weeds. But these are very safe products. Um, when you look at the labels, the Fiesta is, uh, is a high iron, which affects broadleaf weeds, different than it affects the turf grass, which is a monocot. Um, Final Sand is a soap-based product, very effective. Um, what I see with it is I see similar results to uh, 
your traditional die quad applications. Um, I did also uh, list, show here a couple of uh, organic insecticides. Um, what we find is that we start to see um, aphids and other things feeding on our ornamentals, our annual and perennial flowers, et cetera, around our, around our properties. So Azagard is a, a neem oil extract. It's been highly purified. And so one of the things that was lost in that is uh, straight neem oil, which is very popular, uh, organic insecticide. It's got a pretty solid odor. It's also very thick. So in certain situations, in certain water um, chemistry types, it's, uh, it's hard to mix. So Azagard, easy to mix, um, very effective. You get a little bit more residual out of Azagard. Um, then you do out of Evergreen, which is a pyrethrum brace product, um, very good, consistent knockdown. Um, if you have, uh, the other thing is that Evergreen and um, another product we carry, uh, Piganic, they have other um, vegetables and other things on the label. So they are able to be used around um, um, edible crops. So very, um, very effective, just not much residual. And that's kind of why they have some of those other crops on the label. Um, but um, you'd be able to spot spray and you would um, also, um, both products are relatively um, low impact on beneficial organisms, things that, you know, bugs eating bugs, et cetera. And then um, the last one here is Antex. And we are starting to see now some products coming out for your general pest control issues uh, around the bases of your home, et cetera. And uh, Antex would be an example of that. So um, those are some programs and some ideas that um, we put together to help guide people into more environmentally um, safe programs for their, for their fertilization and their weed and insect um, issues. So again, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, listening to the presentation today. And if you have any questions, feel free to email us at uh, uh, Winfield United. Thank you.